Welcome back to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. Whether you're watching online via YouTube or you're listening to us wherever you download your podcast, first of all, we thank you for tuning in. Um, share, like, subscribe, tell everyone you know about this wonderful podcast. My name is Caleb Talley. I'm joined by my co-hosts Jeff Emmerine and Davis McIntyre. How's it going, guys? How's it going? Well, it's going great. Mm -hmm. I'm officially changing my first name to Jameson. That's <laughs> in honor of our unofficial, <laughs> unofficial. <unpaid> sponsor. <laughs> We're Jameson, on, hit us up, please. We're on week four of celebrating St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are excited to have with us today a friend of Startup Junkie, Josh Stanley. How's it going? Good, man. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. And so Josh, awesome. is uh, he's been with a few, uh, he's, he's been in the community for a couple of years, was with Rev Unit, and now he's at Cartwheel. Uh Give us the origin story. How'd you get to Northwest Arkansas? Uh, yeah, yeah. I came, you said I came here through Rev Unit. So myself and Chris Coy, who's a co-founder at Cartwheel, started an agency called Teamwork out of Las Vegas in 2015. I get all my dates mixed up. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in 2017, we're about two years in. We had like a million and a half run rate going and ran into one of the executives at RevUnit started a conversation. It was totally the serendipitous interaction um, that led to us meeting Joe and Michael, who are the co-founders of RevUnit. Uh, and like culturally, I'm just rambling now, not really telling you the whole story, but uh, culturally aligning it just felt right. Like I liked them both, Chris liked them both. And so we ended up doing, they acquired us, they acquired teamwork. So we became the, the Vegas arm of RevUnit. And, but through that, I was traveling to Bentonville probably four or five times a year. And I was like, man, and I've been here before. When I was at 1-800-CONTACTS, we had a project with Walmart and I would travel out here. I went straight to the home office though. And, you know, not the most, you know, elaborative tour to see, of the area. Yeah. Not a lot to see. Mm -hmm. And then, but during these trips, I was taking time to go to Crystal Bridges and like kind of go sightsee a little bit, mostly around Bentonville. I didn't spend much time in Fayetteville yet. I was like, this is an amazing place. Like there's kind of small town, you could feel the small town values, small town values. And then, but yet there's an energy to it. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. feel people have ambition and are trying to accomplish something here. Um, and I don't know how, how to describe that better than that. But on top of that, also feeling like there's kind of mid midtown sized amenities, like nice mm -hmm. restaurants and the airport's mm -hmm. easy to get in and out of and probably more direct flights than the area should have. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, all that is, drew us to finally just pulling the trigger and moving out here. Um, and that was, yeah, it was, I had just become president of RevUnit like at the end of 2018. And then we did a private equity transaction in the summer of 2019. Uh, and that's when I moved, which was a hard time to move out, like doing management meetings and kind of doing the roadshow that you're doing when you're doing, uh, you know, a private equity kind of transaction. There's a lot of work to that. It was a lot. It was a lot to manage. A, a lot of that fell on my wife, just to call that out. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's fell in love with the region. Still love the region. Moved out in 2019, and then uh, yeah, we got a good solid six months of getting out and about. We were just talking about the, the startup crawl in 2019. Like yeah. six months, and then it all shut down. And we were talking about yeah. that the other day. And we had this this uh, community capital event with We Thunder and and the folks from WeWork Labs, and I'm like, dang, this is the first mm -hmm. live event in person we've had of any consequence since October 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That whole period during the pandemic was just kind of a blur. Yeah. And I was well, just thinking it just it. goes yeah. like that. It was just like one giant mm -hmm. free yeah. Zoom call. Right. Never yeah. just wanted to end. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like limbo. Uh, a lack of real life events yeah. leads time to kind of feel blurred. And it there's a, there's a lot of studies and empirical evidence that talks about how mm -hmm. even moving yeah. has a traumatic impact on your brain and yeah. your, your ability to remember because sure. it's, a, it's a very clear event in your life. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. for a two year period, we didn't have a lot of events in our lives happening and yeah it just does feel like a like it it feels like two years happened in six months well, looking you, back. you saw mm -hmm. everybody and you're even able to see people through zoom that you didn't necessarily know very well we got access to people on the podcast we never would have gotten to otherwise right yeah but it was kind of like watching a freaking movie mm -hmm. it's like i think i'm still asleep right i'm gonna wake up yeah and then so just anyway. to stand up on that stage last week and like look out and see all those people fast, you know, from, yeah. and think back two years ago, it was just like, it felt like yeah. yesterday. It does. But yeah. at the same time, it felt like it was a long time ago. It does. I mean, we, we talk a lot about the intentionality of having these events to, to drive 
creative collision, something that I mean, Google talks a lot about. Right, they, yeah. They do things. And anyway, so I mean, way off topic. But <laughs> no, no, we're it's glad good. to be in person <laughs> and, and face to face. Give us a little bit more on Cartwheel and, and how you got, that's kind of the rest mm-hmm. of the story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, let's talk about 2020. 2020 for me was, and I think this is not too different from for a lot of people, like a reflection period, um, mm-hmm. maybe being home alone a lot. Not alone, but obviously family flowing in and out. We have two kids. Um, and dealing with that dynamic, but of trying to work in, in the same work and do school and live sure. and home life all in the same space. But yeah, it became a reflection period for me of like, what am I doing? Is this what I want to be doing? And about four years ago, I had spent some time with Christian Anderson at High Alpha yeah. uh, up in at in Indianapolis, and that High Alpha is a venture studio. And we can maybe talk about the difference between startup studio, venture right. studio, and all mm-hmm. those things. But I did a sprint week up there four years ago with Joe Sam Weber. I told him I had actually mentioned to him, I was like, "Yeah, when I'm done, when we're done with this, I want to go do a startup studio." And he's like, "Oh, I know somebody that runs one of these or is a partner at one. Let's go see if we can." participate and we did and I left there just thinking like yeah this is the right model like this is not to say that there's a it's not the formula that makes a success it is the team and the people behind behind the processes and and ceremonies but Mm -hmm. like the the idea of removing or even like pulling forward what we all know to be the case that 90% of startups fail how do you pull that that failure forward and fail before you form and fund Fail, like fail before you mm. put time, people, resources, talent behind an idea. Like fail it first, um, and then only fund the things that make the most sense that mm-hmm. escape this gauntlet of sorts. And you know, by talking through that, we've kind of just explained the startup studio model. Like yeah. the model mm-hmm. really is. Mm-hmm. It's unlike an incubator or an accelerator. And there's nothing wrong with those models. Sure. But they they assume an existing entrepreneur with an existing idea who maybe is charismatic enough to rally a team behind them or rally funding and pull them into a model where they can be accelerated mm-hmm. or assisted. And you know, a lot of people around them that ask how might I help, where the startup studio model is really let's do our own discovery around problems. And you're trying to be efficient around that with that process mm-hmm. and be targeted with that process, but you're discovering problems and then you're identifying solutions and you're kind of running, you know, what a, an entrepreneur should be doing, running validation on that, like doing user discovery, interviews with potential customers and kind of creating stage gates of like, okay, these are the ideas that can make it onto the next stage gate where we're going to do experiments and demand testing. And then, oh, if it makes it through that, then you're going to do like, hey, for a startup studio, we look to find an EIR who can eventually become the co-founder, CEO of that mm-hmm. idea. But that person's responsible for taking it through that last stage gate of you know, validation of willingness to buy. And we also add into their like investor validation. Are people willing to invest in this idea? Mm-hmm. Again, before you form sure. a fund. Right. Well, right. It's, yeah, it's, it's a methodology that allows you to divorce yourself from any kind of love affair with a particular mm-hmm. idea, That's which perfect. most entrepreneurs have real difficulty with, even yeah. though we advise them all the time. It's like when you're going through customer discovery, try to be a consultant to your own idea. Yeah. Forget it for a moment. Go find pain. But this this methodology, that's part of it. Yep. I mean, it's just part of it. And then you can find the right people to run it when the time is right. Yeah. If you can be objective and everything you're saying is right, like, and I've been in this boat and I actually just talked to a friend last night who's an entrepreneur, I think, holding on to an idea that he should have let go of by mm-hmm. now. And but you get emotionally attached and you mm-hmm. do what mm-hmm. we're all human and we all do. We we have confirmation bias. We seek data that validates the decisions we've made in life. Yeah. And that applies to the business you've started as well. You're gonna seek mm-hmm. data that suggests this is the right idea. So yeah, we try to remove that kind of cognitive bias layer that exists mm-hmm. in all of us through this model. Uh, not to say that it's perfect because we're also still humans doing this right, process. Right, right. Yeah, our, our objective, I love the way Chris says it, like if we take a macabre approach. We're trying to kill ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like if you, if you look at it as how can I kill this idea and if the idea won't die, I guess I have to form then and find something it. There. It's, yeah. a, it's yeah. a different yeah. mindset. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that kind of your first approach? Because obviously we see that a lot too. Um, consulting with startups all the time is is that, yeah, the really tied to an idea. Is that kind of the first approach where it's let's really try to shoot this down first yes. and then kind of remove, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because once you bring an EIR in, you're start. I mean, we, you guys just had Amanda on who's, who's yeah. phenomenal. Like mm-hmm. what an amazing talent to bring to the region. 20-year vet from Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. pre-IPO at Facebook pre-IPO at eBay, 
a female software engineer with 20 years of experience, like just a unicorn in this region. Um, but yeah, I mean, once you've attached that person to this idea, they're going to inherit, you want them to attach themselves right. to it. Mm -hmm. So we try to get as much of that validation done up front before we attach somebody to it who is going to, by nature, start forming an emotional attachment. Because mm -hmm. it isn't, right. like startups are an, an emotional game. Like you are yeah. falling in love with a customer, you're following falling in love with a problem, you're you're determined to make it work. Like it's it's a, you're filling up your emotional tank and trying to go to war every day, right? Like, mm -hmm. see, this is the reason why arranged marriages in some cultures have a much higher success rate than lower divorce rate. Mm. Think about it, right? Yeah. Because there's this sort of a priori wisdom that the parents or the, whoever has that aligns the people together. Now, yeah. I don't know, they may be put to death if they get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, just, it's, the same, it's the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. It's the same kind of thing where you can arrange it at the right time, right? Like bringing the ER in. It's really. Really, a, a, a difference maker, and the stats back it up too, right? Yeah, the stats are pretty strong. The stats are very strong. Like faster. I mean, if you just break it down, what do you care about? Like higher valuations of businesses, companies that come out of startup studios, at least top tier ones, four times more likely to be billion dollar companies. Um, a lot of people point to speed, like how fast you get to these rounds determines your success rate. Well. Companies coming out of startup studios get to seed round in 10.8 months. They get to series A faster. Like they just accept that they truly accelerate mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. growth faster. And that has a lot to do with this kind of shared service layer that a studio provides where we, through our experience and our, our network that's constantly growing, are trying to give opportunities to these founders. And then as you stand up new companies, they become almost like a, you know, a cohort of sorts of shared knowledge mm -hmm. where hey, here's what I did in my first six months that really worked. Share that with the next company that's being formed out of the studio. You kind of form a natural bond with those uh, called port codes, if you will, or portfolio companies. So I think there's just a ton of advantages to the model. And the thing, I, you haven't asked, but I'm going to answer questions that are in my mind where I'm like, why does this matter for the region? You know, it's this is a region that has a compelling story. Like we have Walmart, Sam's Club, we have JB Hunt, we have Tyson Foods. I mean, there's more cumulative revenue flowing through this region than there is in San Francisco. When you look at cumulative revenue flowing through to headquarters, mm -hmm. more than Boston. Um, why is this region not showing or, uh, like the same level of startup volume that uh, Austin is showing? Sure. Mm -hmm. Right? Like if you go look at Austin, what happened in the late, late 80s to early 90s, you had Dell sure. went through mm -hmm. an IPO and you yeah. had the Dellionaires phase. I think there right. was something mm -hmm. over 2,000 millionaires created in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And what do you, what happens when an area gets 2,000 millionaires, they're gonna start investing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like we- It's we, a virtuous we, cycle of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we have this amazing kind of anchor, these anchors, these, these if, if we were a retail center, we have three power anchors, right? Yeah. And so, you know, how do we build up the shops around them? That's been the challenge. And so one of the compelling things about the startup studio model is it's, like the classic startup model tends to be college kids. Like people think like the 20 something yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, hot mm -hmm. shot out of college, that's kind of the mental, you know, the social network sure. model yes, that we've right, all inherited. Right, right. And the reality is, you know this, like people who are later in their career tend to have a higher success rate with startups. Mm -hmm. Like there's higher success rates with 40 year olds. And what do large enterprises have? They have tenured senior leaders in middle management, but at the same time, they're also probably golden handcuffed. They've got a nice salary. They've got a mm. home with a mortgage. They've got kids with tuition coming around the corner. So, how, like, am I going to take the leap and mm. take two years off at the stage where I'm best suited to do a startup, where I have the highest probability of success? You don't see a lot of that happening because I'm, I've already established my career. I'm already making money. I already have dependencies. But the startup studio model offers a path for them that's different. Like, you can come in at a reasonable salary day one and attach yourself to a startup that's been validated that lowers your risk it's like, not all on you it's not mm -hmm. all on you mm -hmm. right and it's just mm -hmm. it's a unique model that i think is very well suited to this region yeah. in particular because of the dynamics of the history and what's possible here yeah. like we are this mm -hmm. this is an area that has global reach like we have for some like 1400 cpgs office out of oh, this yeah. region that's great um like there's just tremendous opportunity here but we've yet to kind of Fill, there's some gaps in the you know entrepreneurial ecosystem that are just now starting to get filled. That's right. 
Um, and I, you got, I mean, you, Jeff, and Startup Junkie have played a major role in kind of helping us get to this stage. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, let's let's do right by the history of the region and kind of all the work that's been put in to build kind of an ecosystem and let's take it to that next stage. Let's have the next wave happen. Well, getting, getting more viable starts, you, you know, we also have an account concentration problem here in that if, if, you, if, you, if you do the analogy with this place with Detroit, imagine if you knew in 1955 what Detroit would be like in the 1970s. Mm. Would you have done something different? Mm. You know, would they have diversified the economy away from just automobiles? We've got huge account concentration in retail. Right. And actually the supply chain, the food stuff we have is still tied to retail right. in some respects. So now is the time to be creating things that leverage the talent in the area. Yes. But that are going to build a diverse base of new companies. Right. You know, we sometimes we talk about we need a hundred, hundred million dollar a year companies that aren't directly tied to Walmart, to Walmart. Hunt, or Tyson. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we get there, then we've got something. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. We've got that base of what comes next. And I think the startup studio can play a real material role in that. Yeah, it, it's not a silver bullet by sure. any means, but yeah, it's contributing to one of the gaps, like or not trying to fill one of the gaps, really, to say. Well, your, your first one out of the out of the shoot, Pushkin, is it's it's leveraging the fact that you got somebody that's great that was pulled here. It's not directly tied to retail. Right. It speaks to food service right. and, and the restaurant side of it. It can leverage all this other talent that yep. we have in food and, and, and retail knowledge, but it's not relying on it. Right. right? They're not mm-hmm. selling to, to Walmart as right. part, of the, part of what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, it, even when I had this same thought process when I moved to Vegas, because we lived in Salt Lake and we moved to Vegas mm-hmm. uh, to when I work, started work at Zappos. Also, that move was about getting closer to my, my wife's family, but all that aside, like the decision making process, I think for most people, even though it's anecdotal to me, <clears throat> is, well, if Zappos doesn't work out, where do I go, right? Mm-hmm. So I think if you're thinking of moving to Benville, you're like, well, if Walmart doesn't work out, where do I go? Mm-hmm. And today you could say, oh, I could go to JB Hunt or Tyson Foods. How attractive are those as, you know, uh, they're established industries. If you're a, a technology talent, you might be looking for some new challenges with in new tech using, you know, just different, more innovative approaches. And just by nature of those industries and what they make money doing, they don't tend towards those those kind of patterns. So sure. I'm looking at the industry and I'm thinking like, where am I gonna go if this doesn't work out? Right. So yeah, we need, like we truly need to fill the the retail center out, right? We got the power, <laughs> the power yeah. brands holding mm-hmm. us down, anchoring the center, but we need the the great clips and the other the other brands alongside is maybe a bad analogy, but uh, you know you need other shops there that brought to drive people to this mm-hmm. the center, mm-hmm. and, and that's what we need here too. We need, yeah, we need fifty million dollar businesses. We need hundred million dollar businesses. We need to kind of fill this whole thing up. How many do you think you're going to be able to do a year? So you grow this first one out. What's the cadence look like for the startup studio? Yeah, so the current model. You know, Walton Family Foundation was gracious enough alongside Innovate Arkansas or Winrock to help us do this pilot program for 16 months. Mm-hmm. So this 16 month period is like, hey, it's it's pretty lightweight, pretty lean team that allows us to, to prove the model and launch two companies. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do two companies by the end of this year. We've been fortunate enough to have Pushkin uh, already be out the gate. And we actually just heard on Monday that uh, Atento, and by the time this airs, that'll be public knowledge, but mm-hmm. Atento is leading the round with a large investment that'll be public knowledge very soon. And then we're kind of closing out with smaller investments right now. Um, but yeah, then the, the next goal for us over the next nine months, between now and the end of the year, is to get the next company out and launched. We have one that's kind of, we take a Kanban approach, like you can't, mm-hmm. we, we don't let the next company enter the next stage until this current one's out of the pipe. So it's like we either need to take this out behind the, sh- the shed and shoot it <laughs> right. so we can make room for the next one or we need to form and fund. Uh, and since this one was formed and fun- funded, we're now like, as we're closing this raise round, we're now moving this next one into position. So now we're gonna go find a new EIR, and kind of start this last, what was intended to be a three month cycle. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we'll have this next company launched in three months. It's pretty crazy. I mean, it's, it's in the Web3 space, and I know we, you, you guys have been sure. dabbling in that. Sure. Or There's more conversation happening regionally around that space, but this is a company that we might do several hundred thousand in revenue before we even form and fund it, which is wild. Mm. It is wow. wild. Wow. All, all the stuff in Web3.0, blockchain, mm-hmm. crypto, NFT-related stuff is just 
nuts yeah. the amount of money that's running at that. Yeah, and I, we spent a whole segment just talking about that, but I really believe I, I'm, you know, I was having a conversation with Cleet Brewer, who you know, yeah. about this being a region that could lead out in Web3. And, you know, we're having this conversation around, oh, well, it, yes, it could if it was supply chain tied and, you know, some of the kind of ways people mm-hmm. think about Web3 or blockchain technology mm-hmm. tying mm-hmm. to supply chain. I'm of the belief that it could be like we truly, any state has the right, any area region has the right to win right now. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's the Wild West. It's the frontier. Yeah. Yep. It's a digital frontier. Mm-hmm. Nobody owns it yet. And it doesn't have to be tied back to one of the existing clusters that's here. Yeah, yeah. Because it's so nascent and, mm-hmm. and it's just it's bubbling stuff yeah. happening everywhere. Yeah, it really will be who, where can you get a concentration of talent mm-hmm. and success stories? Yeah. And we hope to be one of those early success mm-hmm. stories or, you know, crank one out out mm-hmm. of the studio. Right. And we're trying to also at the same time attract some other talented people in that region or in that area to this region right right very cool yeah so you're 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 um this far into kind of the first uh you know this pilot what have you learned that you didn't necessarily do in this first like phase what's something that kind of has kind of surprised you or yeah um it i mean this was our first startup studio we talked to 12 different venture or startup studios as we, we treated it like a product what do you do with mm-hmm. a product you do a lot of research up front mm-hmm. so we talked to other studios talked to people in the operational level talked to people at the partnership level went back and spent a week with with high alpha with christian and elliot and ryan um and you know i think what we thought we could do and what we actually could do has like there's clear things that we would do different if we were to start over i think one of those things would be like this whole this whole EIR coming in at the stage it did was not the original plan, um, but we were hitting a breaking point where it's like, hey, we can't manage to take this to the next. Like, I can't take it any further because we've just got there's just not enough of us as individuals as as people. That uh, the, most of the team is kind of cross functionally talented for the for the most part, um, and so we can do a lot with with a, a little bit of talent, but. You know, there was a point where it's like, oh, yeah, we have to bring an EIR in earlier because otherwise this thing is just going to sit because we're not making any. We can't take it to the next stage. Right. So that, that was a that was a lesson learned in real time that we reacted to that if we were to do it again, we'd do it at the same time. Like this idea of a third stage didn't exist <laughs> when we started. It was like, oh, yeah, you have to have a third stage that is led by an EIR. Uh, the the. The thresholds were there, but we didn't have a separate stage with this idea of bringing in an EIR. We thought we'd bring them in towards the end end, Mm -hmm. like after willingness to buy, after investor validation. And if you're going to do even two in 12 months, I mean, you're processing 20 ideas to get to two. Mm -hmm. So it's just was getting to be too much. So, yeah, I, I think we've learned lessons that are hard to articulate around how to change it and how many people you need and, and where to have them focused at what at what parts and then where in the studio that you know will take forward with us as we kind of move forward next year beyond the pilot keep up to date on the latest news and economic development with the arkansas economic development commission's arkansas inc newsletter each month get the arkansas inc newsletter which spotlights the latest project wins and developments throughout the state delivered to your email The newsletter features major project announcements, company expansions and relocations, news articles, rankings, and more that highlight why Arkansas is a great state to do business. The newsletter is a snapshot of what AEDC has been working on and what we are following. The quarterly Tech Trends newsletter highlights the latest news in Arkansas's growing tech sector. You can learn about new Arkansas tech companies, computer science and cybersecurity initiatives, funding and venture capital announcements, and even more. AEDC offers four quarterly newsletters, the Food and Beverage Industry Digest, Aerospace and Defense Beacon, Timber Trends, and Tech Trends. To learn more or sign up for a newsletter, visit arkansasedc.com slash news. You know, the, the difference for the listeners between the venture studio and the startup studio, as I understand it, correct yeah, me, is startup studio, you don't have your own attached fund necessarily, so you've got to go out and and get the fund. One of the things with high alpha is they've got a good size fund. And yep. so some of those early funding steps they can do on their own. Yep. How do you how do you manage that 
the, the fact that you don't have a nested fund yep. and and move it forward with just as much success as a venture studio. Yeah, yeah, you described it perfectly, and you'll find another gap we have today is we don't have like a startup studio can still have a fund, but is only used for pre-seed funding. Like it's not the follow-on funding where High Alpha or PSL out of Washington, they have a follow, they have the sidecar fund where they can do follow-on funding post the pre-seed get, get up and running. So we actually have to fund or facilitate the funding of the pre-seed round, um, which in this case went very smoothly. I think it's because we had one, we had a great founder, we had a great co-founder, we had done all the validate, like, we had all the due diligence kind of data room documentation mm -hmm. baked mm -hmm. into our process. And even even how we treat the financials, like we're kind of building them from an audit ready perspective up front. Like how do you yeah. how do you start with audit ready perspective on the financial mm -hmm. side, even though we're not getting audited yet because we haven't sure. But mm -hmm. but you're ready for it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's there's a there's a level of I think sophistication, if that's the right word, of how we're approaching it that allows us to kind of come out the gate with like, what do you want to see? Like we have, here's, you know, the 35 interviews we did, we documented every one of them. Here's, you know, our first pass at the income statement of what the first five-year mm -hmm. performer would look like. Here's the second pass based on feedback. Like you can, we can kind of show them every, you know, stage of how we got to this point, mm. which is, mm. I think, I think for most investors, a, a valuable point of view like oh yeah mm -hmm. like you're not perfect i could see that you've made iterations along sure. the way but i have all the documentation to it i can see everything right mm -hmm. right right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well um <clears throat> what what kind of uh advice would you have to somebody you know maybe not in this region a different region who doesn't have access to like a startup studio say mm -hmm. well two questions here you know somebody who has a startup and wants to vet those ideas to you know, maybe um, eventually get connected with a startup studio, or you know, somebody who has all this experience and um, has this network, but there's nothing in that kind of region mm -hmm. like a startup studio. What what kind of suggestions would you have? Yeah, I mean, if you just take the process, mm -hmm. like. I would actually advise anybody considering a startup to just go interview a couple startup studios. Yeah. Just talk yeah. to them about their process and then self-evaluate. Like, have I gone through those same steps? Right. Am I taking a, a you know, an emotional approach and a, mm -hmm. or am I objective? Am I subjective or objective around how I've approached this? Am I in love with my idea? Or, you know, have I really looked at it as an outsider looking mm -hmm. in? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something anybody mm -hmm. could go do. Yeah, that's, you have about, a, that's probably valuable for any startup, right? Yeah, yeah. If you have yeah. A, whether you have a startup studio in your in your region or not, like everybody should look into them to understand how they approach the process mm -hmm. because they are having better, they have a greater success rate, a higher probability of success mm -hmm. than tr the quote unquote traditional model. So there's something mm -hmm. there to be learned. And then if you do have a startup studio in your region and you are like a middle manager, Here's, I mean, I was this, this was me at, when mm -hmm. I was at 100 Contacts or, uh, or Backcountry even, like I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had imposter syndrome. Like I went and got an MBA thinking that was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And after I did that, I'll have enough confidence in myself to go do this. That yeah. wasn't it enough either. And it was finally just like, all right, I just gotta, I just, at some point I'm gonna have to do this or not do this um, and took the risk. But mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, again, you get into, I mean, I've got a certain salary and I've got certain dependencies and I've got cars right, and houses right. and kids. Yeah. And yeah, if you have a startup studio in your region and you have what you believe is an entrepreneurial mindset, like it's a great thing to reach out to, to even just express that you have interest. Like, mm -hmm. hey, I, I have interest in becoming an entrepreneur. Um, I, I think I have those skill sets, would love to talk more and better understand, like mm -hmm. better assess. Cause I, I do believe they are a tremendous opportunity for any Anybody who mm -hmm. wants to be a founder but has, for whatever reason, life life's currents took them into the corporate world and kind of kept mm -hmm. them there. Mm -hmm. Following right, up yeah, on, yeah, that's on, great. On, on Davis's point, you know, a while ago, and, and I think it still exists, a lot of blue chip MBAs were thinking, well, I'm going to do a search fund type mm. of play. Are you familiar with that model? No. And it's essentially a model where they align with private equity. They've got a strong MBA. They're good operators. Maybe they've got a corporate background. Got it. And they go find a company to buy. Right. And they run it. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that this startup studio, venture studio model can attract that same talent. Yes. That maybe doesn't want all the pieces figured out. Because a lot of times when you're doing that, that's almost like a turnaround deal. There's right. you know, you're buying a family mm -hmm. business and 
you know, they, they could be good on the sales side and terrible on operations. Right. And, you know, there can be cult of personality things with founders, with the, the family members. But this is an alternative where in a way it's, it's this clean slate thing that doesn't have all the baggage. Right. It has been fully vetted. That's good. But if you can get to those blue chip, you know, the Harvard Business School folks and others that maybe don't want to start with something that's completely their own idea. Maybe mm-hmm. they're not the idea guys. They yep. really are the integrators that can grow something. Yep. It seems like this could be a good alternative to a search fund. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I think I, well, after you described it, I'm like, oh yeah, I know somebody who's yeah. in that realm from McKinsey. And, and yeah, I mean, that's a great model. There's nothing wrong with what you that, that model or that approach, but you're right, you are inheriting, it's a change management problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you, you got to mm-hmm. change either culture, processes, ways of working, or or just straight up talent. You gotta swap people out. Mm-hmm. Um, versus, your, yeah, you said it perfectly, like in, in this scenario, you're inheriting mostly a blank slate. Like the, all that's really been done is you customer validation. Your DNA <laughs> thumbprint yeah. on it right. is that initial EIR in, in terms of setting the culture and helping it move forward. Yeah, you are a co-founder. Like yeah. you are truly helping co-found the company. So it's, it's, it is, you're right, you're co-creating, you're, mm-hmm. it's not inheriting a finished product. By any means, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. No, that's a great call out. It's like a home builder versus a like remodeler. <laughs> yeah, 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 a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah it's like a spec, <laughs> spec home. Oh, we got a bunch of asbestos remediation. Oh, yeah. and the foundation is cracked, which is what you get in the turnaround sometimes. Yeah, that's yeah. a great. That's a really good analogy. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it, this startup studio is like a spec home. Like we haven't yeah. put the carpet yeah. in, the flooring's not in, the cabinets yeah. are in, the, mm-hmm. the appliances aren't in. You can put but, the marble flooring in that you like. Yeah, we yeah. framed it all up, and there's some plumbing, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, um, I'm still thinking about how you know we um, Star Junkie needs a Las Vegas arm to like rev unit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> for personal reasons. Scouting for personal reasons. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 so. Until you're there for like mm-hmm. more than three days. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, I tell you what, I would rather opt for like a Park City. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, yeah, we can go there. You yeah. know, yeah. somewhere where we've got good skiing in every direction. Yeah. And yeah. You do mountain biking there during the summer mm-hmm. too. Yeah, you can do mm-hmm. that too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, but this uh, is the mountain yeah. biking capital of the world. I good. saw yeah. it come out yeah. in, a, in a post yesterday. Mm-hmm. If, we, you, if we, you Google it right now, if you Google, we're number one mountain biking Bitten. capital. It, we it, pop it, up. Um, Google it pops up. Bentonville, Arkansas. Mm-hmm. That that mm-hmm. is it, totally off topic, but but it's <laughs> yeah. it's kind of relevant no. because. Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of what you've been doing, a lot of what happens in these startup scenes, is you just decide we're going to go do this, yeah. and then a coalition of the willing kind of forms around you. Right. Mm-hmm. So Stuart and Tom Walton decided this is going to be the mountain biking capital of the world, and look at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, mm-hmm. clearly they've invested a lot oh, yeah. to make that happen. Right. But it took a coalition. Mm-hmm. It took a coalition yeah. of people to line up behind them to say, "Why the hell not? Yeah. Let's yeah. do that." You're doing the same in. thing. Yeah, yeah. Why yeah. the hell not? Why mm-hmm. can't we have a world class mm-hmm. startup studio? Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Right to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. It is an attitude. It's like mm-hmm. we can do this. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you don't have to inherit the yeah. patterns of the past. Like yeah. you can break form and go do something mm-hmm. different. And I love. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And even I, I, to refer back to Amanda, like really one of the selling points of moving here, her husband is a mountain biker. Right. Yeah. Like so, mm-hmm. it does have an impact. It really yeah. does affect having a recreational activity, especially one where you can take pride in saying that this is the best there is in the world. That's mm-hmm. a, that's a pretty well, compelling. Well, and, and think about it too. If you were to draw, I mean, there's, there's great attributes of anywhere you want to live, but if you were to draw the attributes of being in, in San Jose or, or Redwood city or San Francisco or any of those places out there in the Valley versus being here is you probably got an hour drive or an hour and a half drive in any direction mm-hmm. to get to the kind of outdoor activity you want to be involved with. Kind of stuff we have here. Yeah, here you can kind of fall out your building, <laughs> yeah. and you've yeah. got soft surface trails and the greenway that are like right there, every everywhere you go. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, throw sand in their eyes, but I really am. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a great place. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I'm, I've grown more attached to it over the 20 years that we've been back here after spending mm-hmm. a lot of time on the East Coast. And yeah. I'm sure that's the kind of stuff you saw when you moved here as well. Yeah, I'm curious, how did, when you came here, or it sounds like you came back 20 years ago, what motivated you? Or what, it, was, it was, it was, was my there parents a, were here. A life, my, okay. my parents, yeah, it was, it was one of those things where my, my folks were elderly, they were tired out of the military, they lived here, and we needed to be closer. And then once we came back here, uh, the thing that kept us here, and particularly over here, mm. was all of the other stuff that has been put in place. I right. Mean, 
we, we can we could contrast this place with what it was like to live in the Mid Atlantic. We lived in a cool place in Annapolis, Maryland. Mm. The time we spent on the West Coast, the time we I spent internationally, and I wouldn't live anywhere else now. Mm. I mean, it's I've waited I've waited on. Yeah. Although I'll say, if somebody said you can live in a yurt in Asheville, North Carolina, <laughs> right in between those thirteen microbreweries and the chocolate uh, factory, oh, that would be yeah. I, that that's pretty be tempting. tempting. That's <laughs> tempting. That's, <laughs> that's tempting. But but this is just in all seriousness, Northwest mm-hmm. Arkansas has got got it all going on. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's interesting when you talk to people that move here. So we had Phil Libin at at the hackathon. Yeah, yeah. We, we yeah, yeah. So we he co- was very unassuming there. Yeah. You know, the unassuming billionaire that just yeah. kind of, yeah. you wouldn't be able to pick out of the crowd. Drifted He's an awesome guy. Town, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was asking him like, hey, so what? how did you guys end up here of all places? And it was just like, he had, I think he said he came here and visited either his wife had friends or yeah. something along those lines. Friends or, friends or family, they had come visited yeah. and they Airbnb'd for a, uh, a few months and then it was like, oh, we should just plant plant our seeds here and, and yeah. grow here and yeah it's it's once you once you come out here once you visit i think you get it yeah but it's hard when you're talking to anybody who hasn't been here oh well, yeah like, arkansas yeah. what are you yeah. well right, i mean they're, right. they're, yeah. all they're hearing in their head is banjo music right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they remember uh, burt reynolds from deliverance and that was actually mm. shot in georgia it wasn't here <laughs> right but you get those images that are that are most appropriately applied to places like west virginia about Arkansas. Yeah, I'm, uh-huh. I'm curious, what, what do you guys, throw some yeah. Yeah, as you think about, and I don't, I don't know how much of your team is remote today. You probably don't have much remote. Is well, that true? We've got no. one team member in Seoul, South Korea. It's pretty remote. That's wild. <laughs> okay. Um, and I guess technically one who's hanging out in Dubai right now. Yeah, uh, well, and one and one also who does global business development, that's Slovenian. Mm-hmm. He's, he lives in Slovenia, but he's our global business development guy. Yeah. yeah, I know he's in Dubai right now because he was sending me pictures from the beach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious as you think about how I mean, this hasn't been talked about a lot recently. It doesn't feel like like we went through a phase where we we're talking about remote work and work from home and all that stuff. And maybe it's a little bit of a narrative building back up around return to office. But curious what your opinion is on where is Arkansas? Does Ar- is Arkansas at the advantage as we escape? the idea that you have to be co-located to the company you work with. 100%. Okay. 100%. Mm-hmm. We win we win that conversation 9 out of 10 times. And okay. the reason why is you can I mean even though the housing prices are going up everywhere including here, you can live in an affordable place mm-hmm. and work for anybody. Yeah. And all these places that might have coastal or even global headquarters they don't really care where you are, particularly if you're a professional, you know, digital worker. Mm-hmm. I think we win just mm-hmm. based on quality of life, cost of living. You still got accessibility to the airports. For us, yeah, it's. I think it's been an advantage, and we see yeah. those people. It's like, yeah, I'm working for X Y Z company, but I wanted to move here because right. I heard about the mountain biking and the cost of living, and it. And there's not as much chaos, and you don't have to worry. In Fayetteville, most days about getting mugged or shot or whatever. <laughs> um, it's. It, it's just better. Yeah. It's just better. We haven't totally lost our damn mind here. <laughs> and to the resources around to support an individual that works remotely or, you know, if you want to go into an office for certain days or take meetings somewhere, those resources, I feel like, are growing up around the community, mm-hmm. too. I mean, you've mm-hmm. got, of course, we work labs in Bentonville, Chandler mm-hmm. leading that. And likewise, here across the street has you know workspace and but like mm. the ledger and all these other places that are you know popping up top notch um workspaces for someone that's working remotely from a for a company that they if they want a space to i mean you can work from a you know one of the nicest parks in the country or you can go work from one of the most state-of-the-art offices right. uh, wherever you want and it's all accessible yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. easy to get to you can ride your bike anywhere even to the top floor of that office building yeah yeah right, yeah, yeah. right, right. Uh, yeah. cycling accessible <laughs> yeah uh, you know I, what i wonder though is if they're going to have somebody from like the exports or whatever extreme sports figure out how to do a jump off the top of oh, that. Probably. Oh, hands down. You know, and Absolutely. if they want to have a landing That's grand pad opening in the right backyard there. of where the treehouse and black apple artists are, <laughs> yeah. guys, I can arrange that. Yeah. Yeah. I just can imagine that, that would just be such a good ridiculous video, somebody taking uh-huh. a bike off the top of a ledger and landing in a pool or something in the back of the treehouse. Pool of cider, <laughs> even better. I feel like you need to make this happen. I I like, doesn't this we can get some sponsorship else? around no. that. <laughs> kind of, it's a viral idea. We could really spend that. the war can be in beer coins. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We can do it. Yeah, so that's good. 
What's yeah. next for this? So you got this thing rolling. This I have a feeling that this is uh, this is something that's going to keep you occupied for a period of time. Uh, it, it seems like it's a passion. It kind of is a convergence of all the things that you've done up to this point. Yeah. Where do you, where do you see it going over the next three to five years? Yeah. I, I mean, we want to extend, right? Um, how we approach that, we want to grow it and, ex- and extend the period of time. Like we, uh, this pilot was truly meant to be a pilot sure. of, to prove mm-hmm. the model. So we want it to look more like a true asset class like establishment where this is a three year fund that yeah. funds. You know, our initial model was let's raise ten million dollars to fund a three right. year, a three year, mm-hmm. right, right. three year mm-hmm. kind of startup studio. Like we want to move back towards that model. Gotcha. Um, it might be a larger fund. I, I I see us having success with the first two companies mm-hmm. um, out of this year, and then taking that success and using that and leaning into that to to go towards the private model. Use that as the basis mm-hmm. to go raise the money. Yeah. You will have the traction and the track record to show that you know how to do it. Yeah, and we want to do the sidecar fund piece of this. I, I want this to be a venture studio. I'm just, we're gonna crawl, walk, and run, right? right. Like, yeah. And so yeah. we're still in the crawl phase. I think we move to the walk phase next year, and there's a couple different options for us on how to approach that, but um, I'm in this for the 10-year like, yeah. plan. I, I'm in this to see I believe, and I've seen a article on this, uh, I do believe this can be the next Austin. I, I mm-hmm. really believe that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's incredibly fun and energizing to be a part of that and to feel at least like you're contributing to that. Yeah, yeah. And I, it takes a village. It's not something done by any one individual or any one company. Um, but I think we've got the right, like we have established people who understand the history like yourself and Startup Junkie. And then we have new players coming in Mm -hmm. that I think are bringing new energy. I think it's net positive. Absolutely. And then, you know, as we build on that together, as as more new people come in, it's like an amalgamation of new talent coming to the region, going through serendipitous interactions and finding the opportunities. And then these groups that come in with their kind of resources and network who can help like as those things start really le- like building off of each other and leveraging each other i think we have that Cam- cambrian explosion moment yeah. I, I think it's like mm-hmm. it feels like we're close to it you just need the light the lightning bolt to hit a few times yeah 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. turn that rna into life so. yeah i mean look at the last two years like we've i feel like and, and this is I, I don't mean this in any way offensively like Ox and Acre Trader have been the stories, right? Like sure. those are the yeah, stories sure, of the sure, region. Yeah. Sure. And they were great stories. And I love both the people behind them and, and the stories they have. We just need more of them. Right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. We, yeah, right. we need to be right. talking about an Acre Trader and an Ox every three months. Yeah, that's the whole, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's an excellent point. It, it's true also on the investment side is you, you've got to have the, the space between the growth and exit of some of these things to be closer together. Yeah. Because to avoid investor fatigue, there's got to be regular reinforcement that they can put money into things. And it's, you know, any kind of venture, angel investing, you put your money in and you wait. Yeah. But over time, those things need to start hitting more frequently. And when they hit more mm-hmm. frequently, it reinforces the whole thing. Yeah. People believe and then more, more fuel gets put in the tank and off you go. Yeah. I, I want to help bring people off the sidelines. I, I, I want to help. Um, we want our reach to be broader than just standing yeah. up new companies. Like we want to be more immersive in sure. bringing, whether it's the college system or bringing you know gra- uh, degree seeking individuals into the model to help them understand. Oh, this is if I'm going to go do my startup someday. Like hopefully I've learned something from this process and being mm-hmm. a part of the studio. Mm-hmm. Whether they become a, a member of a new co that we spin out or not. Mm-hmm. Like our like yeah. So when you ask what's what's next, it's just like whatever the region needs like yeah. the startup studio is still what the region needs so that's the main focus but I think there are other things we care about that we believe can contribute to this overall story that everybody's contributing to and hopefully are the things that we believe will add value truly will add value yeah. um, mm-hmm. and then we can uh, you know hopefully help help startup junkie help um, innovate Arkansas help E for all, like name a program and we'd yeah. love to help yeah, yeah. contribute mm-hmm. to their success so that we can keep this kind of ecosystem spinning, get the flywheel effect going. You, you're never really mm-hmm. done. No, right? you're not. You, yeah. You're never really done. And and the, the more that gets done that's good, the, the, the higher the bar is raised. And people in the startup scene kind of get that and you kind of thrive on it. Yeah. If, you, if you ever got complacent and comfortable, it probably wouldn't be very interesting. Right. And, you know, as... 
as one of the kind of incumbent early players here, it'd be real easy to take this kind of parochial scarcity view that says we can do all that stuff when mm-hmm. we need all these other people. We decided pretty early on that, first of all, there's too much to be done for any one group to do. That's right. And if you assume positive intent, which most people have, and just collaborate with anybody that will collaborate with you, it's amazing what can happen yeah. from that. Yep. And so all these experiments and different models and formats that have come out, some are going to work and some aren't, but more are than aren't in yep. terms of mm-hmm. how we're pushing this thing forward. And so I... I'm optimistic and I'm excited about it. And I think that one of the things that's in the DNA here that you've probably seen is people are first question is going to be, how can we help? Mm -hmm. Not why the hell are you here? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's more, how can we help? Yeah. Yeah. There's that optimism. And and there is, yeah, that is not uniformly true in, in geographies that are in the old South Mm -hmm. because some of those places, like I got mine, Mm -hmm. you're trying to take mine, right? Keep mine. Here, this is a hard scrabble place. I mean, you just look at what what J.B. Hunt and and Tyson and Sam Walton had to go through. They had every disadvantage you could imagine mm-hmm. building those mm-hmm. businesses. Every single one you could imagine. Right. And yet they built these outside businesses. I think people here have that attitude. It's like we can do this. Yeah. Because nobody's going to hand it to us. We're right. just going to have to figure it out. And that that's infectious. Yeah. When people come in, and they see that, and it kind of self propels. I think. Yeah, no, I think you're spot on. I, I think that's part of the energy that is yeah. kind of almost tangible here. You yeah. can, there's just it doesn't it doesn't feel like a zero sum game. It doesn't feel like you have to compete against others to win. It feels more like hey, like we all have to band of brothers this together yeah, to yeah, get yeah, it exactly. to yeah. get it to that yeah. next yeah. that next exactly. wave. Um, if we're going to turn this into a I don't, you know, you could argue that this isn't a great idea <laughs> to turn this into the next Austin. Um, I'm sure there are people that have been here for a long time and think like, I don't want the, the you know, Bentonville yeah. to be, or mm-hmm. Northwest Arkansas mm-hmm. to be the next Austin. The good part. Well, well two, yeah. two thoughts, yeah. two thoughts yeah. about that. I mean, that is a model that we, we often look to. It's like we're 15 years before Austin and yeah. some of us who, who were involved in different things in Austin earlier on can kind of see that. Right. You can see where it was in the late 1990s and whatnot. But there's, there's two things. So Steve Case, will, he's got this, the thing he calls the rise of the rest. Oh, rise of the rest, yeah. And I always say it's the rise of the best. Mm. We just haven't had our time yet. It's not the rise of the rest, like we're some unclean masses that need to be given religion so that we can do something. <laughs> it's the rise of the best based on work ethic. You know, we, right. all we needed was the tools and the, mm. and the, you know, right. maybe the, the knowledge to move forward. Mm. And it's the same with comparing us to Austin. I think we'll be the best NWA we can be. Mm. And there'll be elements of it that will be like Austin, right. but I think we can be better and uniquely ourselves in right. some ways. Mm-hmm. We're think, never going to mm-hmm. be Silicon Valley because there's only one. We're never going to be Austin because there's only one. Yeah. But we can have our own place in the sun yeah. in NWA. It is very unique. I mean, I don't, I don't hear a lot of people talk about it, but I've been fascinated by the idea that this is... Like, it's not one city. It's, yeah. it's mm. a co-op of... Yep. We don't talk about... I mean, I said Bentonville a second ago, and you guys probably talk about Fayetteville because you're based here, but we, it, more more often than not, you talk about Northwest Arkansas. That's catching yeah. on. That's NWA whole... is becoming the brand. Yeah, so it's like it's we're growing a region about. as opposed to yeah. a city which feels unique in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I don't, I can't think of another example of, some, there isn't an Austin-like example of a region growing like that, like for as there to be. And- Everyone's arms are kind of locked around that. Yeah, somebody yeah. might be listening yeah. and thinking, oh, I got an example right off the top of my head. I don't have it. I would love yeah. to hear so, it. Well, yeah. sometimes, sometimes people will talk about the, we'll go to the, the, phone the research triangle yeah. part, you know, uh, Raleigh Durham. Okay. North Carolina, where, oh, okay, yeah. Where they have that. But but you're right. This is this kind of strange, uh, semi linear corridor of medium sized cities that have all decided we're better yeah. together. I mean, there's yeah. a Northwest yeah. Arkansas Council, there's yeah. like decisions made. At a, at a broader scale, mm-hmm. and I think you're, to your point of this could be better, yeah. if it is going to be better, it's probably be going to be because that is so different. Like, yeah. that isn't... Yeah. There's like the... the better together. Yeah, better yeah. together. Mm-hmm. And there's a quote like, different isn't always better, but better is always different. Yeah. Right? Like, so I that would be... It would be interesting to see how that plays out and yeah. how that... Mm-hmm is an advantage over time. Yeah, and there's some exciting stuff too as you think about bridge building that only an hour and a half away you have Tulsa. And right. Now there's yeah. some real and now we're starting to real yeah. intentional efforts and, and for some of us who who came here from the outside, you look at some of that distance between places and you're like, 
how come there isn't more collaboration? Right. Because it's this interesting size city that has its own attributes and we've got this <laughs> corridor here. And seeing that happen now, I think there can be some magic that happens right. between NWA and Tulsa. So, and so and it's compounding, chat. like, you know, start to connect, collaborate with one entity and then the, another entity reaches out and you start to form those, forge those relationships and it kind of just yeah. builds on mm. itself. Wait, here's my narrative on remote work. Um, and why this makes sense. Sure. What you just said makes 1000% sure. sense. Um, at RevUnit, mostly a distributed workforce. Like, yes, we had Bentonville and Las Vegas mm -hmm. and Austin for a period of time too, but most of our work workers, the, the staff the talent was all over the place. Right. But we brought everybody together twice a year, right? You had an all hands twice a year. That got to be, you know, when you cross a hundred people, it gets more, more expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you start thinking regionally, like, yes, we should be hiring out of Tulsa. Tulsa should be hiring out of North, Northwest Arkansas in a remote first world mm -hmm. where remote is now table stakes for the companies. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's just a matter of time before that's the natural state yep. of things. Uh, we can keep trying to force people to return to work, but you're going to lose talent. Like, go yep. go read the Apple article. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so true. Um, so at some point, you're going to be like, okay, we're going to have to embrace remote work. Can we try to hire more regionally so we can easily bring people together sure. once yeah, a quarter, sense. twice yeah. a year, whatever it's, that it's cadence is? That's drive, very true. Yeah. A long yeah. flight. A two, yeah. yeah, or even yeah. just a, a, a short flight. Uh, yeah. You maybe uh -huh. start thinking about things more about what are your direct flights. Yeah. Like, when I start really projecting forward into a world where remote first is the model state politics matter more than ever right where i live is more a decision of income tax and yep. amenities and my lifestyle mm -hmm. not about where is my office at right, right. Yeah. and then you yeah. start thinking about from a business perspective where am i attracting talent talent arbitrage is washed it doesn't matter like i mean we've seen that in real time like it used mm -hmm. to be you could hire you know a senior dev out of north Star and Arkansas for uh, pennies on the dollar for what you would hire out of Silicon Valley. That's leveling now. And that's not yeah. the case yeah. anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. This is, we're that's just we're, true. we're flattening yeah. out across sure. the board. So like when you really start thinking about these dynamics, what does that mean? How will that change? And, yet, and in that world, in those dynamics, you should be creating regional connectivity. You should have a partnership with Tulsa. You should have a partnership with Kansas City. Absolutely. You should have a partnership with the New Orleans. Even eight hours is not yeah, un yeah. irrational. Yeah, no doubt. Where you could start saying, hey, this is a region now that anybody, we, we share talent and we share recruiting and we share resources so that we can keep talent in this region, sure. not in mm -hmm. this city. Sure. Mm -hmm. More of it, more again, that abundance mindset versus scarcity. It is an abundance when mindset. Lose, it's, yeah. it's when it's cliche, but it's win-win if you think about it as an abundance. They've yeah. got people we need that we don't know about. We have people they need that they don't know about. Right. And we make that make that work. Yeah. Well, listen, we could probably continue on with some of the stuff that I think is really juicy and, and interesting, but we like to land the plane with the one question we ask everybody. Okay. And, and the person that won this Oh, there's a winner. Question, <laughs> yeah. The person that won this question, and I just I appreciate his sense of humor and, uh, and, and dry wit, was Phil Libby. I won't tell you what he said until okay. you say what you're going to say. Okay. But the question is, now that you've, you've had all this experience, you're running Cartwheel, you were president at, at uh, Rev Unit, you did all that great stuff in support of Zappos. If you could go back in time, mm. 10, 15 years, with the wisdom you have now and tell your younger self or give your younger self some advice, what would it be? Ooh, wow. Wow. Um. Ooh, I don't have. I, I wish I was prepared for that. I should have been prepared for this question. If this is the question you ask every time, um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is spend more time with your family. Um, mm -hmm. I went through, and it's, I, I still struggle. I'll get really personal mm -hmm. yeah. on on the on the mic, but I posted yeah. this on LinkedIn. Like my identity is largely tied to my profession. Yeah, uh, and I've struggled separating my my work identity, my career, my achievements from my identity as a human and for you know for going back 15 years I got married like close to 15 years ago 17 years ago like yeah I would go back and tell myself spend more time caring build your identity around your family and and get to know yourself better so that you can be a better father husband um, and boss employee all the things all the roles we play yeah like, I think that's what I need. I would need to hear. That's great advice. And, and as an entrepreneur, it's easy to become 
one dimensional, mm -hmm. really self absorbed, yeah, at, at the expense of everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are long stretches of Brett's childhood where you know it, it was born, and I remember he was ten, and mm. in between there, yeah, I was busy. Yeah, right? and, yeah. And you and you look back on that, and you think. I could have done that better. Yeah, yeah. I could have done that better. I think for people like you, and I would, I would guess that we have this in common. Like, I love what I do. Like, yeah, my same. my work is my hobby is my is my passion. Like, yeah. I love what I do. I love building things with other people. I love seeing other people succeed, and I love being a part of a group succeeding together. So it's like this. It 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 pulls me in, not just you know from a livelihood standpoint yeah. but but from a like passion standpoint that's what, what brings you energy yeah 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 so it's yeah. it's hard to tame that it's hard to like hey 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 <laughs> yeah. you need more balance so yeah i, I, totally I, get it. I know i know what you're talking about yeah. so so i'll tell you the, the winning answer of all time okay so so phil said and obviously he probably heard this question i don't know about 25 times before, oh, i'm sure yeah but he said so well here's my answer he said if i had a time machine and i could go back in time I wouldn't need to worry about anything else. Uh, I have all this yeah. future knowledge, and it was essentially that was the answer. Uh, it's like, oh, I, I, I'd be the richest person in the world, and I'd have everything I wanted because I'd have a time machine and I could go back in time. Oh man! I so bet the Cubs in the 2017 World Series. Yeah, one of those yeah. things that was so disarming the way he said it. It's like, yeah, we all kind of feel like we're dunces at this point for asking, yeah. <laughs> but we still ask it. Oh uh, yeah, so uh -huh. these yeah. great answers. I mean, like like that. That was an awesome answer, yeah. and for yeah. someone like myself and. Uh, Davis, who haven't don't have families yet, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. earlier in our careers, I think that's very um, valuable information. To the no, journey absolutely. is the destination, yeah. and don't forget about those closest mm -hmm. to you because yeah. the family mm -hmm. is the only legacy that really matters. Yeah, and, you know, most people will not be remembered specifically for what they did at work, but those people who are still here after you that you're related to. Right, that's what really matters. Yeah, that's real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how can people find out more about Cartwheel or, or get in contact with you or wh whatever you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, cartwheel.studio, so not a .com, but .studio is where you get our email, mine and Chris's, Chris's part, uh, my partner in Cartwheel Studio, our email's there, feel free to reach out. And again, I'll say what I said earlier to your question of, mm -hmm. hey, guess what? There's a startup studio in this region. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're in Northwest Arkansas, have entrepreneurial you know, desires and you feel like you have the entrepreneurial mindset, please reach out and make yourself known to us what your skill sets are. As we're exploring different opportunities, we're going to be here, you know, thinking about you because you reached out. And honestly, um, Amanda came to us because someone reached out. I mean, it wasn't her that actually reached yeah. out, but like through the chain of outreach, yeah. we, it led us to Amanda. So, I mean, that's how we find that's how we build our co-founder pipeline. People mm -hmm. reach out and we're actively seeking people as well. But awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank awesome. you guys. Yeah, Appreciate thank you. Yeah, it was great. Right. Ecosystem builders, entrepreneurs, chambers of commerce, mayors. If you're interested in taking your economic future into your own hands, we've got a book that can help you. Creating Startup Junkies, Building Sustainable Venture Ecosystems in Unexpected Places is the guide. It's a little bit inspiration. It's a little bit toolkit. What it will allow you to do is take your economic future into your own hands and build a sustainable small business innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem in your backyard. If you'd like to hear more, check out creatingstartupjunkies.com. The Startup Junkie podcast reaches over 100 countries and has had over 100,000 downloads. If you're interested in reaching some of the most motivated and engaged innovators and entrepreneurs on a worldwide basis, give us a shout.